Hey everyone, welcome back to Taproot TV. I'm Benna Hughes and I'm here with Ken Reed. Ken, how are you? I'm doing awesome, Benna. How are you today? Doing great. Excellent. We have an amazing topic that we're going to be digging into a little deeper over the next few weeks. Uh, Mark Paradise is working on a new book. He is, yeah. It's always nice. exciting when he's doing that. And it's going to be on how to fix human error. And that is... I mean, isn't that what we all try to do? It, it is, and it's kind of like the basis of tap. It is really. the basis Un of tap. Understanding why people make mistakes and make errors, and uh, he's writing a, a book to kind of give you a an overview of the different ways of uh, that people make mistakes, and then things that can be put in place to fix that. So. It's the foundation of what we do. It is. And he recently wrote a blog article about this, and I think it was up on what March. 27th? It was, it was in March. Yeah. We'll yep. put a link to that blog article for you. But we were going to just kind of start the, the topic for you today. And then hopefully, um, fingers are crossed, that next week Mark Paradise will come in. And either next week or the next, we'll dig deeper into some of these topics. So, how to fix human error. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wish there was like a one-line answer to that question. And uh, uh, we could uh, put ourselves out of business and, yes. and have everybody be safe. That would be terrific. Yes. I'd, I'd be happy with that, quite honestly, just to everybody never made mistakes but yeah we're quite uh, the problem causers we are. <laughs> yes that's, that's what humans do so that's what we do um so what mark kind of put together is some some kind of big picture ideas mm -hmm. of things that you can do to help reduce human error and then uh um, over the next few weeks like you talked about we're going to kind of dive in a little more deeper on some of the uh, more academic ideas on it so. they're so interesting we were yeah. talking this morning and we could have just still been talking hours yeah. later yeah. um so let's talk about he had um six human uh, six fixes that he kind of had in here that's that, right. and some pros and cons about these and let's start what we're going to go over a few of them um what is automation yeah automation so um that's that's basically getting human out mm -hmm. right if the human is the one making mistakes well let's let's get the human out of the loop and and that should then pr help us prevent uh those those human errors from showing up and uh uh, automation is a wonderful idea now, and, and especially now as technology has advanced, there's a lot of new stuff out there for automation. Um, I know Mark mentioned, uh, and we had had a discussion mm -hmm. one time about autonomous vehicles. We did. Right? And, a uh, lot has happened since then, it too. It really has. And, and there's a lot of pros and cons to that. And, uh, um, you know, if you can get the human out of the loop, probably less error is going to happen. But The problem is... Humans make the automation. <laughs> <laughs> humans make the automation, that's right. And, and humans, not only that, but even when you get the automation in place, uh, humans are very creative on how to screw that automation up. Right. And, uh, we're really good at that. And uh, uh, we don't do it on purpose, but humans just make a lot of mistakes, even when automation is involved. So, um, you well, know, very they often they don't know what the issue is going to be until they start using it. That's right. Um, I yeah. think that's come up recently. It really has. So we had, uh, you know, we talked about the autonomous vehicles, but... But uh, if you look at aircraft now, there's a mm -hmm. lot of automation and put in place. And you look at the, the Boeing, Boeing 737 problems that they've been having with, mm -hmm. the, with the 37 MAX. That's that's straight automation right. fighting the human and vice versa. That's right? not what you want. That's not what you want. You're hoping that the automation is kind of taking over for the human and, and, and removing that error. But when the human and the automation get together sometimes... Uh, you have some conflicts, and uh, that's where they're at right now. Trying to it takes that. the skill away from the pilot. It does, uh, which which uh, if, if which can be a good thing if the pilot's not as skilled right. at some some specific kinds of uh, operations. Uh, but it can also be a problem then yeah. um, when when that skill needs to be brought back into place. Right. So, well, so. It, we talked about on the autonomous vehicles just real quick. You know, your car, you've got a lot of sensors on it. All it took was a little dirt on one of those sensors, and suddenly the cruise control wouldn't want Doesn't to work do right. what it was supposed to do. Yep, it seems like such an easy thing. And when you have an off-road vehicle, you'd think it would be designed to handle a little bit of dirt. Oh, yeah. And uh, it, it, uh, it kind of screwed up that piece of the system, had to clean it out, and now it's fine. But um, that's right. It's uh, unexpected uh, consequences of having automation in place. And on all of our cars... We get that sensor fault pretty regularly. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about you, but on, on my car, I do. Yeah. Um, idea number two is inherently safer systems or mm. remove and reduce the hazard. Yeah, so if you can't automate everything, which we can't, we can't automate everything, um, we at least want to make the, the operations that the human has to do, we want to take away as many opportunities for error as possible mm -hmm. out of that. And one of the best ways to do that is to remove the hazards in the first place. Mm -hmm. So... Um, if we have humans involved in an environment 
well, if we make the environment safer and get rid of those hazards, well, then the human has less opportunity to get hurt or screw up the environment or mm -hmm. break the equipment. Um, so we that's, talk about that a lot. We do. Uh, that's It's one of the strongest corrective actions is to remove the hazard. So if the hazard's not there, well, it's hard for the human to get hurt if the hazard's gone. Well, um, again, and it, it kind of relates uh, back to automation a little bit. You know, Marcus Miller and I talked recently about the Vanderbilt medical error. Uh, right. And one of the issues was they had automated um, system for getting the medicine out. Right. But there needed to be another safeguard in place so the wrong more, more dangerous medicine couldn't come out so yeah. that you know so that was designed to be a safeguard it was and, and it was kind of overridden by the human a little bit it right? was um, because um, because when you look at it the best idea like we said is to remove the hazard mm -hmm. but in that example the, well the hazard is medication and mm -hmm. well we need medication we, right we, we can't completely get rid of the hazard otherwise we don't have a business so uh, and that's true in a lot of our businesses. Uh, if you're out in the oil field somewhere, I, I can't get rid of drilling rigs. Mm -hmm. that's, there's hazards there. I, I have to have them. So, so uh, uh, what, the best we can do sometimes is mitigate those hazards and try to minimize them. Um, but the problem with that even is that it costs money. It's not a cheap thing to do. No, it's right? not. Um, if it was cheap, we wouldn't have the problem in the first place. So, so it's difficult to completely remove hazards um, without uh, without dedicating the right resources to do it. So just something to think about as you kind of go into that, trying to remove hazards. It's, it's, uh, if it was easy, we would have already done it. So it's, it's usually difficult to f fully remove hazards. And, and, you know, hopefully people can see things uh, aren't working the way they should before something major happens so right. that they can fix that. Absolutely. So. so you can go out and look for those hazards and hopefully get rid of as much as you can ahead of time. Yeah. Mistake yeah. proofing. That's one that's, uh, all these are, I, I, I see it'd be great if they could work if the human wasn't involved <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> these but. are all trying to get the human to quit screwing up, isn't it? <laughs> And, and yeah. to quit, you know, uh, going around whatever the fix has been right. put in for them. But yeah. so mistake proofing. I love the little, um, the picture that Mark has on the blog of the the disc going into the computer. Yeah. And, you know, those are designed to only go in one way. Right. Um, right. Well, that doesn't mean somebody's right. not going to try to... Put it in the wrong way and it's not going and they're sitting there forcing it in until have, it's broken. Have you seen on your camera those little micro SD chips, right. the little tiny ones? No matter how many times I grab that chip and I try to put it in, it's wrong way. always <laughs> the wrong way. And it you don't know it till it's almost in and then you jam it in crooked and then you're trying to pull the stupid thing back out. So it, it has mistake proofing built in. And mm -hmm. yet, I'm ready to jam that thing right in there. Right? Yeah, or, and, or just sit there and, and finagle it, it yeah. until it until it finally goes yep. in. So yeah, mistake proofing is a great idea to try to to make it hard for the human to screw something up. Um, but Still humans doesn't are, stop us. Humans are pretty ingenious. <laughs> yeah, we come up with great ways to, to kind of bypass those anyway. So. It still doesn't mm. stop us, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, human reliability best practices. Boy, yeah. this is a big one. This is a big one. And I think this is where Mark's going to concentrate a little bit over the next few weeks is talking about um, processes and procedures and research that mm -hmm. has gone in to try to uh, make humans more reliable. So, so recognizing that humans screw stuff up, um, what can what can we do as as an operator to prevent myself, for example, uh, from screwing stuff up, from making mistakes? How can I do that? And there's a lot of different things that have been put in place uh, that are taught in different courses mm -hmm. and um, uh, different policies and procedures that are put out there to try to to help us as humans recognize that we have problems and try to avoid those errors. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard. It's well, really let's talk difficult. about a few of these. Yeah, um, yeah let's like, get some examples like so people know what we're talking the, about. The uh, first one on this list is procedure use and adherence. Right, so we give people procedures. Mm -hmm. And that should, that should uh, help uh, with human performance and, and get rid of some of these errors, mm -hmm. and it does. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm a nuclear trained guy. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to think procedures are bad things. They're wonderful things when used properly. But it's that when used properly piece, right? It's a human factor. It, it is. So, <laughs> so uh, how do I make a human use a procedure properly? And uh, it, it's um, depending on your culture, um, you expect a human to just do what he's told. It's right, right there in the procedure. And, and like our kids do. Like our, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> just like our kids. When we tell our kids to do uh, something. Well, think of an example. You know, if you want to think of uh, like a speed limit sign. Oh, that was a, a good one. Yes. Right? So there's a speed limit sign sitting right in front of you. A procedure. It says go 55. Mm -hmm. That's what it says. You look down at your speedometer and you're doing 
other than 55. Fingers crossed. (laughs) So that that right there is a procedure violation, if you want to think of it that Mm -hmm. way. It's more of a policy violation, but it's, I mean, it's, it's the same kind of thing. So just telling humans, I have a procedure for you, follow this. Mm -hmm. Humans just aren't very good at that. And uh, so there's some good things about having procedures. Um, For things that have a lot of memorization and a lot of steps, procedures are wonderful, Mm -hmm. but they don't fix everything. Humans a lot of times. Uh, And the more times you've done something, the more likely you are to feel comfortable in what you're doing. And therefore, you tend to skirt over a few few of the things that you might have been supposed to do That's because right. things have gone so well. That's right. So hey, you know, well, this will save a little time. Or, I'm an expert now. I I'm don't an, need this I, procedure now. I know I how this is going to go. I've done it by the procedure a hundred times now. I don't really need to open this up and look at it. And that's one of the reasons that humans, for example, don't, don't always do well with procedures. Uh, Place keeping. Yeah, that's kind of a, uh, an example of that is just putting check marks on something. Yeah. So I do this step and check it off. I do the next step and so check it off. So it's almost like a, a um, step to make sure you follow your procedure? It is, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, and it's a, it's a great tool. It, it has, has some, real, uh, um, uh, some real advantages to having a good mm-hmm. place to keeping, you know, circle and X method or whatever of, uh, that the nukes use for uh, maintaining their place in a procedure. Um, but there's some pros and cons to that, too. And... Uh, um, I had a uh, procedure that I remember when I was in my previous life that I screwed something up and uh, we, ha- we had placekeeping, but as I turned around to do something, when I turned back, the page had flipped over uh-huh. and uh, I hadn't recognized it. And so I, I went to that step on. and I yeah. kept going and there it was, I, I turned the wrong valve. So, oh, wow. so uh, it's very Easy. simple. Uh, placekeeping can help fix that, but if it's not used 100% properly, uh, you can still cause issues. Well, and... The procedures need to be correct. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't help if you're following the procedure perfectly and the procedure is incorrect, perfect. right? Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot of reasons, uh, and Taproot kind of goes through those in the root mm-hmm. cause tree about why these particular items may or may not work very well. Um, let's let's skip down here to this sure. pre-job brief and mm-hmm. personal as- safety assessment. So there's it's kind of a three-part um, thing we're going to talk about here. So the pre-job brief. Yeah. So remember, these are all... Uh, uh, things that we as, as companies and as people can put in place to increase mm-hmm. human reliability. And one of them is the pre-job brief. And uh, pre-job briefs are awesome. Mm-hmm. I mean, th- there's some really great advantages to those. Um, they, they make sure that you as a, as a workforce are going through and looking at a particular job and looking for hazards and what tools do we need and really good stuff on pre-job briefs. I'm a huge fan of pre-job briefs. But they don't always work either, right? Right, because now we get uh, kind of like what you were saying. We get comfortable with this particular task, and we start instead of taking a five-minute pre-job brief, we've condensed it down to fifteen seconds. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Yep, I, I'm good with that. And now our pre-job brief, uh, the efficiency of it or the effectiveness of it has come down because. Uh, we've done it a hundred times. So pre-job briefs have some great uh, advantages, and yet they can still. Um, not always work as we expect them to work. Well, it's also, we were talking about earlier, you know, we've been having a lot of meetings around here lately, changing some software and things mm-hmm. like that, and we'll sit and have a, a, a meeting about it, and here's what we're supposed to do, blah, 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 and we're told exactly what we're supposed to do. We get back to our desk, and where was that button? Like, where was that? Again? You know, it's like, so there's, you know, y- you forget. You do. Uh, it's, it's real easy to forget. You do a pre-job brief out there. It says, hey, well, I want you to do, and you go over 15 things on that pre-job brief that you want to do for this task. Well, now you're depending on the human mm-hmm. after the after the brief is done to remember all 15 of those mm-hmm. things or to have something in their hand to remind them or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so while the pre-job brief has some good stuff, there's still some um, some hazards that come into play about using a pre-job brief as a, as a tool. So observation and coaching can come into play on this one. Um, that's during the task, yes. right? So now I have, a, I'm going to go do the task and I'm going to have a supervisor there helping me or a, or a coach who's mm-hmm. going to be giving me some, uh, maybe he's a more senior person or he's more experienced at this mm-hmm. task and he's going to help me out and make sure I'm doing it right. Um, again, sounds wonderful. And it is. It, it's a great tool to help uh, train up uh, less experienced mm-hmm. operators. Um, but there, there's some. Uh, you have to assume then that that operator now, first of all, has a good relationship with that coach. Mm-hmm. That he's not nervous mm-hmm. because now I've 
maybe as an operator, I would have been just fine. But now I've got this senior guy staring over my shoulder. Always makes right? somebody nervous. And now I'm nervous about it, right? So that's a disadvantage of having a coach there. So they're a distraction. They're, they can be a distraction, right? So you're sitting there doing the job, and then the coach says something to you, and you, you turn, and you forget what you're doing, mm-hmm. and you lose track, and you turn Yeah, that off. happened a few minutes ago. <laughs> um, we were sitting here discussing this, and, and I was sitting here counting, just doing a simple task, about as simple as you can get, ta- counting how many of these best practices there were right. and my coach here an observer says 15 <laughs> and I immediately lost my place <laughs> I immediately had to start over and start counting again and it was just it's that simple it and, he, and he was wrong and it was wrong so, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> depending on you know the competency too of your observer that's coach. right but that's there's right. I, again you can call my comp senior question that's fine I'm okay with that. <laughs> but that but that was a really that very a simple great example of how a coach task. Yeah. of how a coach can, can cause, uh, wh- while it's a good idea, can mm-hmm. also cause issues by having right. a coach or something. Well, they so. often know so much that it can kind of get in the way. They've got to say something. They right? do. Yeah, yeah. they've got to say something. 15. So then post-job <laughs> brief, um, that I can see as being very important. It is. Um, after our summit is a great mm-hmm. example. We uh, um, After our, we got back from our annual summit in, in Houston, we got back and we had a uh, – uh, a meeting of all our people, and we said, "What what went well, and what can we do better next time?" And it's a it's a great way to do a uh, a brief of of how stuff went really well, and make sure we do it again in the future. Or what what uh, can we improve on? What kinds of things can we improve on? So post job briefs are a a good a powerful tool to help increase reliability for the next time you do the task. The follow up of the that post job brief is important the documentation the you know how you're going to put things into place and such right uh, right that you can't just have the brief and move on no no Um, it's critical that you do something with the results that you came from that brief so well a lot of this stuff we were talking about is um there there's like about what 10 more Mm -hmm. if i'm miscounted (laughs) miscounted correctly (laughs) there's about 10 more of them and one of the things is culture comes into play in all of this and there's even peer pressure or when you know what to do and you skirt past a procedure or something because that's kind of the way people have been doing things right um we had candace carnahan at the summit and she was talking about you know, people knew that there were certain safeguards that were missing. But There's to, hazards out there that they didn't have their safeguards in place. Right. That's right. Yep. And to up production and make, you know, things go faster. And it's always been done that it's way. It's always been done that yeah. way. Yeah. And that is one of, the, I think that's a key thing that really comes into play on a lot of this stuff that can make it ineffective. It really does. Yeah, the, your company culture and, and uh, um, while it all sounds great, mm-hmm. A lot of these ideas, and Mark's going to go over a lot of these in a lot more detail, mm-hmm. but a lot of these um, are actually wonderful thoughts. They're, they they're great ideas. You know, I'm going to uh, um, stop before I do a task if I feel uncomfortable about it, and I'm going to reevaluate that task before I continue. Well, that sounds mm-hmm. wonderful. It sounds great. And in hindsight, when I break something or I get hurt, yeah, it's easy to say, hey, Ken, you should have stopped there and thought about that. I mean, while that sounds wonderful, humans just don't do that very well. And we don't recognize when we're supposed to do that. And Or we may recognize it. And again, that peer pressure or that culture that says, just get your don't job worry about done. It. Don't just worry about get your that. job That's done. That's okay. That's an acceptable risk. So in our head, we've done a risk analysis. In reality, analysis, it is not an acceptable risk. And it's not acceptable. And each company and each culture has a different level of, of risk uh, uh, acceptability. And depending on where you are in there and your company, uh, you, you look at it and say, yeah, that's not risky. While another company would come in and say, oh, my goodness, what are you doing? That's, you can't do something like that. Right. So your, your, cult, uh, your company culture and your, uh, your risk tolerance is just completely different, and it changes how you do a lot of these, these human reliability tools and how you implement them. Mm-hmm. Well, these are such interesting topics, and I'm real excited that Mark is working on a book on this. I think it's going to be incredible. Yeah. And uh, like we said, this is the foundation that Taproot was built on, mm-hmm. is how to fix human error. Yeah. And, and so we are going to keep talking about this probably for a couple of weeks and make a little series out of it. And Mark will come in, and he will dig a little deeper into some of these um, 18. <laughs> You'll probably dig a lot <laughs> A lot deeper into the, <laughs> these 18 uh, uh, reliability and then go on into some of the other um, 
how to fix human error topics. Mm. So, and speaking of Taproot, uh, ta we, we recognize that a lot of these tools have some, some uh, great applicability, but we also recognize the, uh, uh, the, the problems with a lot of these tools. And Taproot has already, it's already gone through and, and, and uh, documented and found these within the root cause tree in the mm -hmm. dictionary. It's kind of built into the system. Um, and uh, one of the things that you can do to help out with these is use Taproot proactively. Go out there and and, and look and see if your people have good procedures in their hands and if they're, why they're not using them. And you can figure all this out by you doing a proactive uh, uh, taproot audit and, and take a look at why people are doing what they are doing or not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, don't wait till get, somebody gets hurt. Go, mm -hmm. go grab the root cause tree and go do an audit. You know, um, to wrap this up, I, it, that reminds me of a number of conversations I have with people. I'll be talking to them. I'll be like, how's your taproot program going after they've had training and stuff? And it may be six months down the road or something. And they're like, well, only a few people are using it. And I'm like, okay. And how many are doing that proactively? How yeah. many are? And they're like, well, what a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should. That's hmm. a really good way to help keep those guys proficient. Right. And so that's one of the reasons we preach this. It's not just to keep them ready for when an incident happens. It's to stop incidents from happening. That's right. I hear a lot of, I hear the same thing during courses, mm -hmm. you know, well, we didn't use it a lot last year because we didn't have that many incidents. And I'm thinking, man, you weren't looking hard enough. You right. Know? There's plenty of problems out there for you to go look at. And all of these are, are problems oftentimes with these human performance tools that Mark has been mm -hmm. talking about. So we'll, uh, he's going to dig a lot deeper into this and how Taproot kind of kind of takes these into account as it, as it puts the system in place. Yeah. All right. Well, if you would like more information on Taproot and uh, interested in our courses, go to taproot.com. Uh, contact us at info at taproot.com. Follow us on all of our social media platforms. We appreciate you spending your time with us today. Um, if you like this, please give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channels, and just keep checking back with us as we're going to have more information. I'm really looking forward to what Mark's going to have to say about this in the future. Yeah. So we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.